coming up on the Orthopreneur Podcast. And this milestone of finishing your very first first draft is it's it's a huge occasion because you learn that actually you can write a book. And I think that lesson is far more important than tweaking your story at this stage. So please do yourself a huge favor and just finish the idea that you're working on before you go and chase anything else. Welcome to the Orthopreneur Podcast. I'm your host, mystery author, Amelia D. Hay. On this podcast, I will bring you writing, book marketing, and self-publishing advice so that you can create your dream author business, build your author platform, and be creatively independent. You can find the episode show notes and lots more information on the podcast page at orthopreneurpodcast.com forward slash podcast. Hello writers, welcome to the final installment of this two-part mini-series on writing with genre expectations in mind. There's nothing worse than reaching the halfway mark as you write your first draft or even as you're starting the revision stage to realise that you're not sure if there's a market for your book. If this is where you're at, then don't panic. It's quite normal to not know what genre you are writing in as you write or finish your first book, but there's something you can do about it. In this episode, I'm going to share with you five steps to revising your your story with genre expectations in mind. Before we get into the steps, I just want to remind you, if you're interested in reading the transcript or would like links to anything that I've mentioned in the show, then check out the very long blog post or edited transcript at authorpreneurpodcast.com forward slash TAP031. If you're on YouTube, you'll notice that I've gone back to an audio only version of the podcast. I've had to pull the plug on the video podcast because I've had issues with outside noise that was interfering with the podcast. In the audio podcast, these noises are easier to filter out than in the video. When I do that in the video, it just sounds very tinny and echoey and it's not a pleasant sound to be listening to as you're watching the video. And on top of that, I have another sore throat. I think I probably might need to get vocal coaching because it seems like a repetitive thing and it has to be podcast related. So why am I recommending writing with genre expectations in mind? Here's what most authors do when they write their first book. Just a side note, I'm including myself in this too. Most writers will write the story they love without considering whether it has an audience after it's finished. As a result, they've finished a product that's so cross genre it's difficult to market. In business, it's easier to create a product or service to fill a need or demand than to create a new target market. So what should you do instead? I recommend researching the online bookstores for genres that are in demand that you would love to write. Doing this would be easier than bending a story you've written to an existing genre. But if you finish the first draft of your story, then this episode is for you. Before you do anything else, go through your story and write a one or two sentence summary of each scene in your book. Creating this list of scenes is important because it will make the five steps I'm about to share with you easier to complete. So please don't skip over this step. Step one, finish your first draft. The best thing you can do for your story right now is to finish your first draft. So take a deep breath and don't worry too much about whether your story will fit into a genre until after you've finished writing. I'm sure you've heard this before, but you can't edit a blank page. So write the draft for you, then revise and edit for your reader. I can't stress this enough. If you get to the halfway mark and you realise your book's so cross-genre it doesn't sit anywhere, what will happen is if you pause here and try and fix your story, what will happen is there's this huge danger that you won't come back to it, that you'll start tweaking your story and tweaking the outline if you have one, or you'll go back and fix things and it will become tough because revision is difficult. Maybe difficult isn't the right word. Revision is like pulling teeth. I'm just going to be honest and say it. It's It can be, especially those first few books, because at some stage you'll finish your first draft and you'll be like, what do I do now? Like for real, what do you do? Because a lot of people give vague advice, like I'll oh, just go through your 
your story and fix the issues. But like, what are the issues? If you've never written a book before, you don't know. The most important thing for you to do right now is to finish that first draft because it's an important milestone. It teaches you, you know, you can actually do this. You can write the first draft of a book and then tackle the next problem as it arises. It is really crucial because what people will do is they'll get stuck on a in the first draft phase and they'll put that aside and they'll go off to this other fancy idea and then they'll work on that and then they'll put that aside and or they'll keep rewriting the same thing they won't actually get to the end point but they'll keep stopping midway during that first draft just constantly rewriting it and this milestone of finishing your very first first draft is it's it's a huge occasion because you learn that actually you can write a book and I think that lesson is far more important than tweaking your story at this stage so please do yourself a huge favor and just finish the idea that you're working on before you go and chase anything else step two read five novels in your genre and know its conventions choose five novels you love with good reviews that are within the category you want to write as you read through each novel make notes on what happens in each scene and chapter and notice how the story builds the second element you will need to pay attention to is the types of characters that appear in each of the books you're reading. At the scene level, make note of how many scenes are character focused, where the cast is reacting to an event, and the number of scenes that are action orientated. And I'm referring to action in terms of fighting, battles, and big explosions. Actually, back to action, I'm not just referring to action in in that sense, but scenes action in terms of something actually happening in the story there's a difference between fight scenes and I used to have a definition of action written up and I've taken it down that's very inconvenient but I'm talking obviously talking about action in terms of plot things happening in the story whereas when I say character focused I'm I'm more talking about characters reacting to the events that have taken place And that is actually referred to as a sequel. Another important element in a story is humour. How is humour used in the genre you want to write? Not every genre uses humour in the same way and it's important to get it right. Lastly, consider how the stories in your genre end. Do the stories need to have a happily ever after moment? Or is an ending where neither the protagonist nor the antagonist get what they want appropriate? Make all of these notes in a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet. I know I'm a nerd, I love Excel, but for me it's just easier to, to see all the elements that I need to see all at once. I'm not going to justify my love of Excel. I'm just going to move on. Now look at the information you've collected. What are the common themes and story elements in each book? Consider which of these are non-negotiable. How do you figure that out, you ask? It's simple. Ask yourself the following question. If I don't have this particular element in my novel, will it still fit in this genre? Therefore, if the answer is no, you need to include it in your book. For example, if you're wanting to write a romantic comedy and it doesn't end in a happily ever after or a happy for now situation, then you haven't written a romantic comedy. You've written something else or your idea is something else and it's really important that you figure out where your story idea fits and you don't market your story as something else because I, when I write Missing, I thought I was writing a crime thriller and I was so sure I marketed the book to a, an entire book blogging tour as a crime thriller and to the first few ads and... Once I started getting mixed reviews, eventually I realised my book was more of a mystery. People kept telling me it was a cosy mystery and I knew it wasn't cosy because there was swearing in it. And just the way James Lalonde is, he's not a cosy mystery character and I I knew that it wasn't cosy. Eventually I figured out it was actually an amateur sleuth mystery. That moment of having that, that light come on for me in that way it was actually really important because it's changed who I've marketed my book to. And now I have a, a lot of, I have quite a few reviews on my books page where people have, writ, have read the book thinking they're getting a crime thriller and they're like, actually, it's not really, it's quite slow. It's a slow burn. And that's a mystery thing. That's the pacing of a mystery. So I've screwed up and I paid the price in my reviews and 
And I also did something with the ending I shouldn't have done. I shouldn't have included the epilogue. I should have left it at a particular point, but I didn't. I included the epilogue as well. And the epilogue sort of changes the story ending. And it's something that happens six months after, and it's not really important to the overall story. But you get it. I screwed up and I wish I took the time and went back and did this. So this is why I'm recommending that you do this before you write, because it'll just save you a lot of heartache. Step three, figure out where you are going wrong. A few years ago, I was at a publishing event organised by Orion Publishing in the Foils bookstore along Charing Cross Road in London. During one of the question and answer sections, someone asked one of the authors if they write to genre or market, and the author said, no, I just write the story I want, and the marketing team figures out how to sell the book. It's not a direct quote, but it sums up the spirit of the answer that was given. Unlike a traditionally published author, you don't have a marketing team to figure out how to market your books. Or to be a bit more blunt about it, you are your marketing team. So if you write a book that is so wild and cross genre, this will become your problem later on is figuring out how to market the book. So what do you do instead? Read your first draft and pay attention to the things that are out of genre. Look at the genre conventions that are deal breakers. And these are the genre conventions you figured out in step two, where you read five books in the genre and you created a list of those conventions. So these are these conventions that you figured out. And you'll notice that as you read those five books or more, if you like, there'll be a common themes maybe not theme, themes is correct, there'll be common elements to each. And you'll notice, you'll begin to see a pattern and that some of them, some of these conventions are in all of the books and it, and it makes this particular book, you know, a cosy mystery or a mystery or a romance or a romantic comedy, you get it. Those conventions that are a necessity for readers, like a happily ever after for romance or a crime being solved and justice being served at the end of a mystery are common examples of the point I'm trying to make here. Are you ticking these big boxes for the reader? If not, you will need to go back and add these elements in your story. And sometimes you may need to write your story's ending Sometimes you will need to add elements into your story to make it fit an audience of people who want to read books that are in the particular genre that you want to write in. And quite often this means you having to let go of the things in your story that you really love because you love them and swap them for something readers are going to enjoy, especially if you want to be an author as a career. But if you're just writing for fun, then these tips aren't helpful for you. Actually, if you're writing for fun, maybe pay attention to the first season of my podcast where I talk about how to structure a story and just ignore the rest because you're writing for fun. But if you want to write commercially and make money, then you need just to really start thinking about your audience. If you've heard something useful in this episode that was helpful to you and you'd like to support the show, then buy me a coffee for as little as two US dollars at buymeacoffee.com forward slash author AD Hay. To help you get a grasp of the genre expectations, I've created a genre tropes cheat sheet featuring the conventions of the five biggest genres. These genres are romance, mystery, thriller, fantasy and science fiction. I've chosen to separate mystery and thriller because these genres have significant differences. You can download this cheat sheet at authorpreneurpodcast.com forward slash genre hyphen tropes. Before I dive into this list, there is one more thing I want to point out. It's okay to not know what you're writing until it's been written. I mean, take the example of that I shared earlier on in this podcast where I wrote a book thinking it was a crime thriller when realistically it's a mystery. If you do get to the end of your first draft and you're starting to revise and you're thinking I still don't know what my book is, it might be worthwhile finding beta readers and getting their opinion on the story and after they've finished the story it might be worth you asking them where, what genre do you think this book is? You could, it might be easy to create like a list, like a checklist where they can choose what genre they think it is. So if you're writing in the mystery, thriller, suspense category and you have no idea, you could put all of those 
elements like mystery, thriller, suspense, other, and just see what people say after they've finished reading your book because readers will tell you where they think your book sits. They're not always right. Like people recommending that my book was a cozy mystery that was not right because I knew, I instinctively knew that that genre has certain quirks and I break a few of the rules that are really important to that genre, like the lack of swearing. For instance, if you're writing a romance and well you thought you were writing a sweet romance but and there's more and there if there's stuff that happens on the page other than the first kiss then you're clearly writing something else in that genre and you should not mark it a romance that does contain even if it's fade to black sex fade to black kissing that type of thing you probably shouldn't mark it to a sweet romance genre because a lot of people who have religious beliefs may read those books not wanting to see sex on the page swearing that kind of thing so you really do need to keep it sweet so if you're in doubt I would just put the book in another category other than that and that is really important be careful with certain genres that have rules that are, that really cannot be broken like with mystery a, a rule that can't be broken with that category is you have to resolve the crime and the person who committed the crime there needs to be some type of consequences for them like they just can't get away with it even if yeah they can't get away with it that's really important learn that lesson from me and this genre tropes cheat sheet what it will be is it will, it will be a list of all the genre tropes on a page and when you sign up to the email list as I update it I will add more genres on onto that list so I'll keep sending you updates like I'm considering adding cozy mysteries as a separate genre and sweet romance and stuff like that so eventually I will send off those genre conventions as well and if anyone shares any genre conventions of any of the subgenres of these, I'll add them to the list and send them off in an email. So you'll get regular updates as well, but I probably won't update it on the podcast. So that's a benefit for signing up for the, the genre tropes cheat sheet. But I'm going to now read out the genre tropes of the, the top five that I was talking about earlier. So the first is romance. So there's a sympathetic hero. Sorry, a sympathetic. I suddenly feel realize that the pronouns I'm using are just very ignorant. Sorry. So so a sympathetic main character, a strong, irresistible love interest, a meet cute, emotional tension. The relationship must be front and center. And the reason why Romeo and Juliet isn't a romance is because it's really about the feud between the two families. That is front and center and the drama about that surrounding that. Even though you you see a lot about their romance and them trying to get together, a lot of that is played out in the context of their family war. And I sort of feel like that's what makes it not a romance and a tragedy. So if you're doing a retelling of that, do not put that in the romance genre. So the relationship must be front and center, an interesting, believable plot, a happy ending or happy for now ending. And if you read five books in the genre you think that your story idea fits into, you will get a sense of, especially if they're quite popular books, popular, highly rated books, you'll get a sense of which of these genre conventions are actually non-negotiable. The second genre on my list is mystery and usually within a mystery novel there is a focus on solving the crime. There is also a closed world or isolated setting where the characters cannot leave until the mystery is solved. This isn't specifically referring to a locked room but usually the crime exists within a situation where people either can't leave or have no interest in leaving until the crime is solved. So maybe it happens at some type of club, like a knitting club, or even if it is in a small town and all the people that are suspects exist in the town. So no one's interested in packing up and leaving because they like living there and everyone wants to, you know, keep that little secret. So in that setting, but you can also have a locked room, but this is a different 
type of mystery altogether. The status quo is disturbed by the discovery of a body, and there are always red herrings. Clues are purposely left to distract the reader. This sounds cruel if you're not into the mystery genre, but I think this is the fun of the mystery genre, is the reader tries to solve the crime alongside the amateur sleuth or detective. Characters tend to have a personal reason for killing the victim. You won't see a serial killer in a mystery book because the motives of, of a serial killer, while they might be personal, it's just different and it's that's more something you'll find in a crime thriller. There's a detective or amateur sleuth as a hero or possibly both and Usually mystery novels have a really strong theme of justice, aka bringing the whodunit individual to justice. Each suspect tends to have their own guilty secret or lie about something and this is something that makes the discovery of the whodunit a little more challenging is to figure out who is lying, why are they lying about it and who is telling the truth. There is some element of comic relief. Usually you'll find comic relief in the cozy mystery genre but even in my amateur sleuth mysteries there is an element of comic relief. It's not something I purposefully write into the book. It's just sometimes James will have an amusing observation that he'll make and that provides a form of comic relief but it's not something that I particularly put in there. It just happens in the moment in the scene and they tend to be dialogue heavy especially cozy, cozy mystery is definitely more dialogue heavy. The third genre on my list is thriller and the focus is on action. A crime is usually committed by a master villain and that master villain has a MacGuffin which is it's just a term that means an object desired by the master villain and that's usually some type of power for corrupt reasons. Clues and red herrings are puzzled to solve with false leads and this is where it does cross a little bit with the mystery genre but it's the difference between mystery and thriller is there's a lot of action a master villain there is a moment where they have a speech in praise of the villain a moment where a character talks about the brilliance of the antagonist or even the antagonist talking about how great their plan is and how much and how they're going to succeed. Usually within a thriller there is a double agent, so a character who says one thing but does another. This character impacts the protagonist's mission. Usually they change sides from the protagonist's team to the antagonist, or they've clearly been working for the antagonist the entire time. And there is a ticking time clock element to the story as well, like they need to get everything done in an insane space of time. And the stakes as well. There's life and death stakes for the protagonist possibly from the get-go their life is in danger whereas in the mystery the danger sort of builds and there's a false ending there's an ending where you think it's all good and then the villain comes back and strikes again The third genre is fantasy. So you have a reluctant protagonist, a magic system. Usually a, a fantasy novel is journey or quest based. Usually a conflict of some type will force an everyday character out of their ordinary world. Within the fantasy genre, the main character has a struggle to master something or the journey isn't easy, like with The Hobbit, because he's not mastering anything. It's just the journey is difficult. So fantasy obviously has, it's what you associate with it the most, is an immersive fantasy world. More often than not, it's medieval inspired. There's a cast of complex characters. It's usually a large cast and there's a good versus evil theme with an all-powerful villain. So the last genre on my list is sci-fi. As you'd expect, it's set in the future in a world that's similar to ours. And like fantasy, there is a obviously a protagonist with a cast of characters. There's a focus on technology with this and you it's in the name, obviously. And once again, sci-fi is also adventure or journey based. Much like Star Wars and Star Trek, they're both journey based storylines. 
There is also a focus on transportation, especially in certain subgenres within the sci fi umbrella. I don't actually read much sci fi, so I can't really comment about what type of subgenres would be transportation heavy. I guess space opera is obviously the one that I've understood the most, but that's just purely me going off watching Star Wars. There's also an environment or world where the story takes place and how technology has affected it. There is in the story an evolution of the language in some way, whether it's evolved, where technology has helped it evolve, or usually there is a evolution of the language. But if you are writing sci-fi, you need to check whether these particular elements are appropriate to your subgenre of sci-fi because sci-fi is a very broad category. And obviously there is elements of culture as well. You get introduced to new cultures. This seems to be a very big thing with very popular sci-fi series is that concept of being introduced to new cultures. Also, it embraces physics. No matter if you're writing soft or hard sci-fi, there is an element of physics physics involved in the story. And once again, much like thriller and fantasy, there are life and death stakes for the main character and obviously the cast as well. So that concludes the list of genre tropes. I did spend quite a bit of time researching these because I don't read in all of these genres. It's not possible for one person to read so broadly across all of these genres. So I did my best to try and research all of the genres that I didn't know as well as the ones I did know. So I hope this helps you understand the main five genres. If you do have something that you would like me to add to one of these genres that I've maybe I've missed a trope that's important or you would like to add something to expand on something that I've said, then send me an email via my website and I'll add this to the genre tropes cheat sheet and email list. Step four, end it right. The ending you give your story is what will entice the reader to pick up the next book. So it's important that you get it right and make it memorable. In terms of endings, if you do something that's not expected, then you should expect polarizing opinions like I loved it or I hate it. James Patterson mentions this experience with his masterclass in regards to the ambiguous ending with one of his books, but this was done on purpose. And he's James Patterson, and that's important to point out. He already has an established fan base of readers who will quite literally read anything he writes. I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that you and I don't have this type of readership yet. So save your genre bending ideas when you have super fans. I've written an ending that is ambiguous, that is kind of ambiguous. It alludes that the bad guy kind of escapes and well, he doesn't escape, he escapes some of the consequences of his actions because he has a means to do that. And the ending's quite polarizing because I've put it in the mystery genre and people get upset my argument for having this ending is because it's it's reality sometimes there are big people who have the ability to escape the consequences of their actions and when you put it in the end of the book you're going to get polarizing opinions like they say I loved it or there are people who absolutely hate it and your reviews will be split so my reviews are sort of sitting around the 3.5 to 3.7 they sort of fluctuate between that star rating because people either love it or hate it and it is really tough to see those reviews on something that you really loved that was a labor of love it's hard so know that going in that when you when you're writing an ending that might be polarizing you're going to get polarizing reviews and those reviews will be hard to take if you want to know more about writing an ending for your story, I've devoted an entire episode to this in season one. You can find episode 22 on how to choose the right ending for your story at authorpreneurpodcast.com forward slash story hyphen ending. And I'll include a link to these episodes and everything else that I've mentioned in the show notes in your favorite podcasting app and on my website. In light of this, you could write an epilogue that hints at how the current book has affected the lives of the characters later on 
down the track. For example, the epilogue in my novella Missing shows the reader where the characters are six months and how the story has changed their lives. This scene occurs after book three and based on feedback leaves the the reader curious about the next books in the series. Thus it does what it's supposed to do but I I still miss the mark with this epilogue. What I led the readers to believe is that book two will contain these characters and that's not true. So I ended up removing the epilogue because they're not going to see what happens next until much later. So I've removed it with the intention of bringing it back, possibly as a prologue for an upcoming book. I originally decided to create the epilogue because my story doesn't end in a way that's appropriate to the genre, but I felt the ending was realistic and poses an important question. So I kept it at first, but ended up getting rid of it because I, I felt that it still wasn't helpful. So if you do create an epilogue, I would recommend that you test it out on as many readers as you possibly can. Step five is to test your product. After you've gone through your manuscript and revised your story with all the things you found in steps one to four, you should have a story that's written to genre. But what if you're still not sure? What if you still have that nagging feeling or you're feeling insecure about your story? Or even if you're not, I still recommend that you take these steps. Enlist the help of beta readers who read in the same genre as your book. And these don't necessarily have to be free beta readers. You don't have to trawl the various forums on Goodreads or annoy family and friends about this. You could go on to places like Fiverr and find beta readers who offer a service. Usually these beta readers will read and answer certain criteria. But before you hire a professional beta reader or a paid beta reader, you need to figure out exactly what you want to know. And I've come to this conclusion, the possibly the easier way you need to it might be helpful for you to create a questionnaire and send those list of questions to the beta reader but quite often they will give you a report and and the really good ones will give you inline comments like inside your manuscript if you've exported it or you've written it in word Ask them about the story genre as a part of a survey as you collect feedback. So it might be best if you say, what genre do you think this story fits into? Or or in which section would you expect to find my book in a bookshop? And see what they come up with. You could give them options, but it's important to know the genres first before you ask. Like, for instance, people keep suggesting to me that my James Alon mystery series and the first book in the Rookie Reporter mystery series that I'm about to release actually are cosy mysteries. And I know that's not correct because James Lalonde is not a cosy mystery character. And there are things that sort of happen in there that aren't cosy. Like there is a bit of blood and gore, there's a bit of swearing, and there is a bit of... Occasionally the books will have a sex scene if it's relevant to the story. And I recommend you use more than one beta reader, that you do use quite a few because you will always get somebody who doesn't quite get your book or your book isn't a good fit for them or they don't understand the characters or they don't like the characters. But you don't want this person to be the only feedback you get because you could could feel tempted to change your story thinking oh everyone's going to feel the same way and that's not true if you hire quite a few people or a mixture of paid beta readers and unpaid beta readers you're going to get a wider variety of answers and you'll be able to see what the common themes that keep coming up in the feedback the reason why i suggest paid beta readers is they will work to a schedule and you'll get the feedback much quicker whereas when you use free beta readers it can be it can take a long time to get the feedback. So where do you go from here? If you want more information about how to write to market or writing with genre expectations in mind or writing for readers, whatever you want to call it, I've 
compiled a list of books that I recommend because A, I've personally read these or I've heard good things about these books and courses but not necessarily taken them myself. But I will explain to you which ones that I've read and which ones that I haven't that I'm simply recommending. So the list of things I have used or bought for myself is Right to Market by Chris Fox, How to Outline a Cozy Mystery by Sarah Rosette, Romancing the Beat by Gwen Hayes, and I highly recommend you check out the courses by WMG Publishing. Often they have courses focused on writing a particular genre. And if your genre is in this, then it will be a really good thing for you to take the course because you'll get a lot of valuable information. For the sake of transparency, I haven't read this next book, but it has a good number of reviews on Amazon. And it's titled Mystery, How to Write a Traditional and Cozy Whodunits by Paul Tomlinson. And one final disclaimer, I recently became aware of this next podcast through an email that found its way into my spam folder, which is quite embarrassing because the email is old and my spam filter is strong thanks to the program that I use. But that's not my point. I have not used any of these courses, but from what I can see, the courses are quite in-depth. So this, the podcast I'm talking about is the M Writing Fantasy Podcast. It has a range of courses on how to write fantasy, including all of the world building and pre-planning phase of writing in that genre. And from memory, I do believe the courses seem affordable. I did check out their, their website and their courses a while ago, but for some reason it just escapes me how much the courses were. To write and revise a story with genre expectations in mind, you need to take the following five steps. Finish your first draft, read five books in your genre and know your genre conventions, figure out where you're going wrong, focus on your story's ending and test your products. As always, I have an important question to ask. Are you struggling to write a story to genre? Or have you found a way to write a story to genre that works for you? I want to hear from you. Come on over to the blog post at authorpreneurpodcast.com forward slash TAP031 and share your tips or struggles in the comments section. And you can download the genre tropes cheat sheet at authorpreneurpodcast.com forward slash genre hyphen tropes. And one last warning, I do have to confess something. I have gone into my mailing system and I've realized that in amongst all of the line editing, I didn't actually press start on the automation, the email automation queue that gives you all of these things. So after I do this, I'm going to go through the automation queue, do any last minute editing and then press publish. So for those of you who have signed up, you'll actually get the product that you were hoping to get. So sorry, it just completely slipped my mind. I did all of the work and then I forgot to publish the email queue after I was done. It just slipped my mind. I'm so sorry. It's super embarrassing admitting this, but I may as well because you already know. Thank you for listening and happy reading and writing, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Authorpreneur Podcast. If you love this episode, then hit the subscribe button and leave a review on your favorite podcasting app. I'm your host, Amelia D. Hay, and I'll see you next week for another episode.